Hello and welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd. I'll be your host for the next hour of answering those landscape questions. We love hearing from you, but unfortunately, we are still not taking phone questions for the time being, but you can get in touch with us with those questions and pictures via email. That address is byf at unl.edu. Please tell us as much as you can about your question, and as always, tell us where you live. And don't forget to check out us, our, our social media sites, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Pinterest. We're starting the show with a sample that, Jody. I think you want to go through really quickly so you can put it away. <laughs> yes, okay, so uh, this was not planned far in advance, but I was digging in the garden and I brought the viewers today some invasive jumping worms. And I can really talk about these for probably 45 minutes to an hour, but I am going to, I have a note to myself. So what does it look like? This is what they look like. And so from far away, they may look like our usual worms, but they are very different because, well, they're not in soil and they're doing completely fine. I've had them out since Monday. But if you want to identify an invasive jumping worm, they're also called crazy worms and snake worms, and that's because of their behavior. So if you actually touch one or you're, you dig one up in the garden, they will thrash around. You'll be able to tell that they're a little bit different. And excuse me if I jump, because <laughs> they're um, they're they're like they're. If you feel them, they feel rubbery. They look glossy. Um, they actually you can feel their bristles all around their body, which helps them move like a snake. And uh, they have a clitellum, which most all adult worms will have, but their clitellum is going to be smooth, unsegmented closer to the head than the middle, and it'll be cloudy. And you can see they're pretty dark, and that's because they feed really close to that surface layer where the mulch is. And so I was just digging in the mulch, and I pulled some mulch back, and they were just hopping out of, um, out of the <laughs> soil. And you can see the, that they just are not acting like regular worms. <laughs> and um, yeah, so if you wanna know if it's a, a jumping worm, you can just like touch it with your foot, or even when you're digging them up, they'll thrash around. Sometimes they'll actually break their tail off in defense and um, they may uh, release some yellow, nasty um, secretions, which are, are, I mean, the whole thing's kind of horrifying because, you know, we, we usually like seeing worms in our garden. But what do you do if you see these? There is a program called the Nebraska Invasive Species Program, and uh, they are asking people to report where they see the worms so that we can document where they are across Nebraska. Uh, there's no you know, treatment for them. We are not supposed to release them. So I don't know, these will be pets for a while. Um, and we're not sure what they do in the landscape right now. So we just wanna monitor and hopefully we can, we can live with them. But the problem with them in some ecosystems is that they are like decomposers on steroids and they will like release so much nutrients that actually get washed away. So they're actually not that great for some ecosystems, but we're not, again, not sure what they do here in Nebraska, but this is how you can identify them. Excellent, and we will make sure we put the uh, website for yes. the Invasive Species Council on, on, our, uh, on air and on Facebook. All right, put, th put them back. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Dennis, uh, yours is also interesting and intriguing yeah. <laughs> tonight. Well, you know, animals visit our yards, visit our homes and things like that. Usually when we don't know, they're there. But they always sometimes leave a sign. Okay, they may chew on something, they might dig a hole, or they might leave, so to speak, what some people call their colon card or scat. So I just brought some scat, and this is rubberized, but it's very authentic, I, I can tell you. <laughs> this one here on this end, this is raccoon scat. And the smaller one is usually buried, because they raccoons like to bury it like a cat. And it usually there's some seeds in it, but doesn't have to be seeds in it. So if it looks kind of like this, this is raccoon scat. This is rabbit scat, and this would be cottontail rabbit, little tiny balls. And there's also brown ones and green ones. If they got a lot of good food, the green ones, they'll come back and eat again, okay? They're copophagy, okay? So the green ones, are, don't take those. They're, they're saving that for later, okay? And then this is squirrel. And it's hard to tell the difference between ground squirrel and tree squirrel. Uh, tree squirrels some, lots of times have little pieces of wood in their scat. 
and the ground squirrel does not have the wood of the scat. This is deer, so it's like the little balls here, but much bigger and not quite the same shape. We have your cat, okay? And then we have both skunk and opossum. Hmm. Very string-like, this is more rope-like, okay? In here, and both these, the cat, and to some degree, the opossum, they have a considerable amount of fur in it. So besides looking at, and color is not the thing. Color is more, what did you eat yesterday? Um, it's more teasing through it and finding what kind of hairs are in it and what it's made of. So if you really want to know your scat, um, we, we do have a guide in, um, on scat identification at our website, wildlife.unl.edu. Excellent, and it's really a good thing those are rubberized. Yeah, these are definitely rubberized. <laughs> 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 All right, Kyle, you know, I, I don't know how you're going to follow this. I know, I should just give up now. I was, <laughs> exactly. I was all excited about my sample, and, and alas, I have crazy worms and, and Dennis. <laughs> <laughs> just crazy. <laughs> But um, I brought, so I have some, uh, some horseradish leaves here um, that are infected with hor uh, turnip mosaic virus. And so turnip mosaic virus is, so we have one leaf here that's very mosaic-y, um, and then there's been a few things chewing on them too. And so here we can see the, the kind of the different coloration that we have on this leaf. And then I have a healthy one up right next to it. So we can see the healthy one's just kind of, kind of pure green. But turnip mosaic virus is one of the most common um, diseases of horseradish in, in the United States and really in the world. Um, you know, we don't have a massive horseradish production center here in Nebraska, so we don't deal with it a whole lot. However, this disease will infect quite a few other plants. Um, it really has, has a broad host range, about 350 plants that it can infect in total. As far as control of this, not a whole lot to do, same with most viruses. Um, we, don't have, we don't have chemicals that we can spray to control any of the viruses. A lot of times virus management comes down to vector management. And so this virus is vectored by aphids. So if you, are, um, if you are, can do anything to control aphids in the landscape, that should, uh, should decrease the amount of turnip mosaic virus. But really as with most of our viruses, once you start seeing symptoms like this, the plant is probably going not, just not going to do very well. And so it's probably best just to pull it out and start again, especially this early in the season. Um, does it affect the taste of the horseradish? It depends who you ask. Okay. Um, and so often it, it just the, uh, won't, won't produce near as big of roots and so you don't get near as much and so what's the point? <laughs> By the jarred stuff, right? Exactly. <laughs> All right, Jody, you get the first picture question. Uh, this is our first tick picture of the year. Um, bronzy sort of a tick, she picked it off. She, she thinks it's Lone Star. Yeah, she's right. So that is an adult female Lone Star tick that looks uh, partially engorged. So um, it had been feeding for maybe a couple of days, but you can see that white spot on its back and that indicates that it's a Lone Star. It also has really long mouth parts if you look at it and it's very round. Um, it does transmit some diseases. Um, we've got ehrlichiosis, tularemia, uh, some viruses, um, and actually even the, the red meat allergy. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, I would, what did you say dog? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I would urge people to make sure they have their pets treated so that if their dog does get a tick, then uh, the exposure to like the, the medication on the skin or from feeding on the blood will kill the tick, but they can still bring them in. So make sure you do a tick check of your dog. Ears, armpits, or leg pits, whatever they're called, in between the toes. <laughs> and people, people check too. Yeah, the in the time. Check your crevices. <laughs> 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 okay, and your second one is, um, this is really an interesting picture too. This is a viewer in York. It's a young burr oak, and okay. she saw these just on one branch. She's wondering what this is exactly. She sent a couple of really interesting yeah, pictures Yeah, and these here. are 
Great pictures, very interesting. So what I think this is, is an, an oak tree hopper. So we did have a lot of pictures last year of tree hoppers, but there's, uh, it's, it's not from feeding, it's from ova position. So when she is laying eggs, um, she does this in, in the tree branches. So um, I don't know if there's a way to prune that out. It shouldn't really, I don't, I mean, I don't know what the rest of the tree looks like. So, but that's what that is. A young tree, but probably all right. Yeah. All right, good. Okay, Dennis, let's just follow up your sample with some questions <coughs> from okay. viewers. I just want, I want to clarify one thing. <laughs> it's not rubberized scat, it's completely latex with soy oil on it. So it was, <laughs> it was made from paraffin of real scat and then the mold was with sterile latex and the release is soy glycerin. So when I put my mouth with soy glycerin. <laughs> So people don't think I'm insane, I'm just crazy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, your first picture is actually from Tecumseh, and uh, this is what they're seeing in their yard, same area. She, she did say it's full of hair, and she thought it was a coyote. No, uh, that's dog. Okay, so <laughs> somebody's dog. That's someone's dog. All right, <laughs> the, the, and your second picture is, this is Waterloo, Nebraska, and um, this is on the back porch steps. Yeah. She washes it off, and the next day there's more. She thinks it's a raccoon. I'm it could be a young <laughs> raccoon, um, young of the year that were born in February, but it's also because of the blackness and the fact that it, it's not covered. See, a raccoon would go someplace where it can bury it, Mm -hmm. And most raccoons will go in latrines, which means they all go in the same place. And the way it's kind of rope-like, I'm almost thinking opossum. Okay. And then we have one that is um, in the backyard, under the deck, on the river rock, usually at night. And he says, as near as he knows, there are no marauding uh, loose dogs. Still looks dog-like to me. <laughs> So they need a trail so may, Maybe a feral dog. There's a lot of feral dogs around. Okay. Yeah, which are dogs that don't have owners. You know, people, we, we hear a lot about feral cats, but believe it or not, in Nebraska, there's a lot of feral dogs too. Hmm. And finally, we have a Waverly viewer. Uh, this is a city park. They've found this. Uh, they don't have a dog. The yard is completely fenced. What do you think this one is? Yeah. And that's good scale reference, and that's a big yeah. something or other. <laughs> yeah, that one, that one's almost looking cat-like. A big cat? A very big cat. Like one that you don't really want in your yard? Well, who wants any cat in your yard? <laughs> but I wouldn't say a bobcat, but a, probably a bigger domesticated cat. Okay, all right. Yeah, it just, uh, it doesn't have enough fur in it to be bobcat even though it wasn't covered. Yeah, yeah, but the feral cats don't always cover. They just kind of go and go. They go away, all right, interesting, all right. Very interesting <laughs> always to have you on the show. <laughs> <laughs> all right, your pictures are of great concern to a lot of people, this first set. Okay. I think we've had about four pictures come in since this first set. Um, this one is, let's see, this first one here <clears throat> is Underwood, Iowa. Okay. And then we have one from, we had a viewer from Wahoo, and we had one from Marquette, Nebraska, and they're all showing and talking about the same thing. And is it, what is this, Kyle? So this looks like a curly top virus. Um, and on tomatoes, actually beet curly top virus is, the, um, it was first described on beets, but it can, can infect a whole bunch of plants in your garden, tomatoes, peppers, potatoes, a lot of them. Um, really, yeah, um, it will just kind of make the tops kind of curly um, and it can um, often stunt it as well and so a lot of viruses will have just an overall stunted growth habit um, is the one way to look at it. Unfortunately it can be kind of difficult to differentiate a lot of these tomato viruses um, without a without doing a, an, an actual laboratory test. Um, however control for them is pretty much all the same. It gets into vector management and so I think this is vectored by leaf hoppers and so if you can um, control the leaf hoppers, which is that possible to control leaf hoppers, Jody? Not <laughs> um, sometimes just... <laughs> you can knock down the population a little bit, but 
So basically, if you have tomatoes like that in your yard or garden, just pull them out and uh, try to remove the remove the inoculum load load as best you can. If you don't, they won't they won't produce good fruit. Um, they'll still produce some fruit, but it won't be a lot. It won't be good fruit. So. All right, and your next one is actually up close and personal. This is hops. And this is actually in the hops yard. Yeah, so what do we I have? This was on? the one that people were more concerned about with the uh, with the beer not being as as tasty. But this exactly. is this is a downy mildew of hops. Um, really, one of the more concerning diseases of hops, um, at least especially in, in the in the United States, um, has been can be very devastating in the Pacific Northwest and in the Great Lakes region. We first discovered downy mildew of hops in Nebraska about three years ago, and since we've seen it really, really just spread. Control for this one is very intensive. Um, so really, um, it requires a combination of, of weeding, and so making sure that you're removing really any weeds around that area. Um, a lot of fairly intensive fungicide program as well starting really once those once those hops begin to grow early um, early in the spring that's when you want to start your fungicide program and then really about every seven to ten days you want to uh, continue with another spray unfortunately downy mildew of hops is one of our sexually reproducing fungi and so it becomes resistant to a lot of um, fungicides mm -hmm. too so if you are doing a chemical control you want to make sure that you are rotating that active ingredient um, with every every application all right, thank you, Kyle. Well, last week we heard from Terry James about what makes a good container for planting. She returns tonight to help us decide what we should plant in those containers. So here's Terry to tell us more. So we have our containers all ready for us. Uh, remember, we went ahead and we got everything filled. We have good soil, and then we have the slurry fertilizer in here. Now comes the fun part. We actually get to choose our plants and be able to get them into our container. The one thing you need to make sure is to know is where is your container going to live? Is it going to be in the full shade? Is it going to be part sun or full sun? That's really going to help you decide what kind of plants that you're going to need to be able to choose to put into your container. But then after that, the choices are limitless almost. Uh, you can go ahead and you can get some some kind of uh, arch or arbor or obelisk to put in there to kind of add some permanent structure to the container. Uh, you can get some trellising if you have something tall and you want to vine up the back. But the one thing that you need to remember to do is to kind of help layer your container. So you want to go with something tall, then you want to go with some stuff that's kind of in the middle that's going to kind of help fill out that middle gap of your container. And then you always want something that's gonna help fill out the bottom and spill out the bottom and kind of soften those edges. You can choose lots of fun things to make the tall stuff. You can do some hibiscus. Um, you can even do a tomato. You can have flowers and, and vegetables inside your container. Just make sure that if you're doing a tomato or an eggplant or something like that, that you do have full sun. So it needs at least about seven hours of full sun a day. One really fun thing to do to kind of help soften the edges is use some grasses. Grasses are a really great addition to your container. Put those grasses in now. Um, they really add that kind of fill in for you. And then as fall comes, they kind of die out because these are all annual grasses. They'll turn brown and then you can actually pull out the dead stuff, put in some mums and stuff, and then you can have your second container for fall leaving those grasses in to kind of help fill that out. You can also go in different colors. You can do all one color if you want to do all reds or greens, uh, or you can do multiple colors like we have here. So make sure that you add something tall, something in the middle, and something that's going to come off the edge. Uh, use multiple different textures to kind of really help make your plant interesting and make sure that you know where your plants are going to live so you know what plants to choose. So go out, find some great plants and get that container going. You're only restrained by your own imagination. If you need some inspiration, you can always see what we do with those containers in the backyard farmer garden. All right, round two of pictures. 
Uh, Jody, this is a worm question. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this person uh, is in Southwest Lincoln. They were concerned that it would be an Asian jumping worm. Um, and they, they sent both this picture and then I think they sent us one with a scale with a ruler mm -hmm. that was a big one. Yep, is it? Well, did they say anything about touching it or anything like that? No. They just looked at it? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I was able to zoom in on it and if you can see that um, clotalum, it's like a pinkish mm -hmm. and it's more in the middle of its body, well, closer to the middle. And you can see the segments on it and it kind of looks like a saddle. So this one is... Just a worm. Yeah, I mean, I can't, I only know invasive worms and non-invasive worms, there's, or, or you know, <laughs> the, the ones jumping that worms are fine. and the other ones. <laughs> yeah, so, other, one's fine. yeah, this, this ones other. are normal worms. All right, and then we, we have this fun thing. This is a Blair viewer. He named this Phil. Okay, Phil is awesome. <laughs> I was pretty excited to see it. It is, okay, it's a filament bearer. It's what the, cater it's a caterpillar. It's also, so it turns into a horned spanworm moth, but I think the caterpillar is way more awesome than the moth. <laughs> and it has er reversible filaments. So it can go like this way, it can go that way. Like, you know, it's a cool thing. Everybody go look that up. Yeah. <laughs> the horn spanworm, but that is a caterpillar. It doesn't look like mm. a caterpillar. Yes. And then your next one is actually a tiny one. This worm was so tiny, they could only get one picture, half an inch long spun on a thread oh. and then landed. Yeah, and that was a really, uh, that's a really great clue. So this one's called the oblique banded leaf roller. So it turns into, it turns into a moth. Uh, they feed on a bunch of different fruit trees, but it's called a, a leaf roller because if you see like leaves in your garden that are like rolled up like this with silk, <clears throat> they have like a little house that, uh, that they roll up leaves. Very cool, all right. Okay, Dennis. Not more scat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm up to here. <laughs> His eyes are brown. <laughs> All right, this is a northern Lancaster County viewer who sent us a picture of a turtle. Oh. She wonders what it is. It's a painted turtle. Okay. It's a common uh, semi-aquatic turtle in Nebraska. And by the looks, it's hard to tell you with just that picture, but there's a lot of mud by the posterior end. And this is the time of year that painted turtles are digging in the mud to lay eggs. Oh, nice. So she may be doing that. She may that. have some baby turtles. Maybe. Ne next next, next spring. Right, yeah. yeah. All right, uh, your next one is, uh, this is somebody who found this snake on their farm near Columbus. She says it's 12 to 15 inches. Mm -hmm. She sent a couple of really good pictures here. She, yeah. she... That's a full grown, seems to be a male, Ringneck snake. They eat spiders and ticks, and unfortunately, that one doesn't look like it's going to eat anything um, anymore. So, hopefully, yeah. a cat killed it and not yourself. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you get a lot of ticks now. Yeah, so that's a good <laughs> They're guy. common. Yeah. That's full grown. Yeah. Uh, and it's called a ringneck snake, found through three quarters of the state, very benign, and feeds on worms and ticks and spiders. Excellent, all right. This is, uh, Kyle, probably our very first image of something going wrong with the turf. Mm -hmm. uh, this viewer, uh, he is in Nebraska City. He said it went from dense green to patches of gray and black, looked like cooked spinach. Um, it was long when he mowed. He was using a, a, a fungicide, an immunox-based fungicide on it. So, and then he did say that it's, now it just looks deadish. Mm -hmm. What is this? Yeah, I think that this is Pythium blight on, on turf. And really this last picture here where, the, where some of those leaves are just looking really greasy. And then the description of looking like cooked spinach um, is kind of what, what I'm going with there for, for Pythium on, on turf. And really with the amount of moisture that we've had and the heat, uh, it's not at all surprising. And so this one, we tend to, really tend to, tends to show up in June and July when we do start um, have continuous nights above 65 degrees Fahrenheit. And so we've had, had, gr had good weather for it and it can, it can uh, turn, turn, turn lawns pretty quickly as well. Um, anything to do. The, the Immunox fungicide, I'm not sure that would do a whole lot um, as far as control for the uh, control of Pythium. 
Uh, and one thing you would, would want to look for would be um, a fungicide with azoxystrobin, something like Heritage um, should work for, uh, to control p uh, Pythium. Other thing that we do for this is really just moisture management. And so water early in the morning, um, so, you allow, so you're allowing all day for that um, soil to dry out. So we don't have that humid conditions at night to increase the, uh, the disease pressure. Tell mother nature. I, <laughs> yeah. I try, she doesn't listen. <laughs> Would you repeat the name of whatever that was again? Uh, pythium blight. No, the, the chemical. Oh, uh, heritage. Sorry. And the... Uh, uh, azoxystrobin is the active, in, active ingredient. All right, excellent, thank you. Well, we are starting to sound like a broken record when it comes to our backyard farmer garden. We have a lot planted, but at the time we taped this week's minute, Terry James was still in prep mode. So let's hear from her about how she got plants ready to go at the Backyard Farmer Garden. This week in the Backyard Farmer Garden, planting is happening. Our plants are a little long, so we have to do a little bit of adjustment. Um, as we've talked in the past before, our tomatoes are gonna get sunk a little bit deeper. Remember, you can get roots all the way up and down those stems. So they are a little stressed, so we're gonna give them some roots. We're pulling off all the flowers and the fruits so that it's gonna send all of its energy back down the roots to help get them established. We're putting our great tomato cages around them um, right when we're planting them, so everything's gonna be ready to go. But our, the rest of our garden is looking beautiful and flower. Uh, the Shelly Penstemon are even are better than they were even last week. The Siberian Iris are going. The, the purple Salvias are going. So come by the Backyard Farmer Garden. We may not have a lot of vegetables that look all that great right now, but the flowers are looking fantastic. So stop by and check it out. Right now it is time for lightning. You ready, Kyle? Oh, yes. And I go first. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> All right, uh, we have gotten several questions from viewers, especially in the eastern part of the state. Spring snow and other crab apples are losing their spotted leaves. What is that? Uh, it's probably scab. The follow-up question is when to treat and with what? Uh, I'm gonna, um, chlorothalonil would work well um, for a fungicide control or a copper-based product would work. Um, treatment. You're kind of within the treatment window, but you really want to start getting um, start those applications before you start seeing too many symptoms. All right, we have uh, viewers who are sending us pictures of molds the size of baseballs, like dog barf. What is that? Uh, slime mold, one of the coolest things out there. It's a f fungus that will grow across your mulch just looking for food. All right, we have an Arcadia viewer who has white blotches on the leaves of their bee balm. What do you suppose that is? Probably powdery mildew. All right, a Holdridge viewer says his hardneck garlic spoiled. Would it be heavy rain that would cause that garlic to rot in the ground? Yeah, most likely heavy rain, and then if it's a heavier soil too, it's just going to saturate and rot. All right, nice job. Dennis, you hey. ready? Yep. All right, um, this is a Lincoln viewer who says they saw a bat being attacked by a large flicker or a woodpecker. What's that all about? The best thing to say is that the bat is probably in a void, making a clicking noise that the flicker thinks is an insect. All right. That's my story, I'm sticking to it. <laughs> <laughs> we have a viewer from Stromsburg who uh, couldn't get a picture, but she saw an 18 inch snake that looked like a garter snake, only it was a light tan in color. It's still a garter snake. Color doesn't make a difference. We can have white garter snake, a red one. Color does not make a difference. All right. How do you keep raccoons from eating your bird seed? Uh, that's a good one. I would trap the raccoon and have it properly removed. All right. This is a Blair viewer who says the squirrels are chewing all the tips off of her big Norway spruce. What's that all about? Probably going to use it for food. All right. Um, a viewer says he has heard that certain types of hand soaps will deter critters. There is soaps that deter deer, but only in the summer. All right. Um, in Papillion, what critter would chew the green beans off? A 13 line ground squirrel. Nice job. <laughs> Look at him smile. <laughs> All right, you ready, Jody? And there was no poo question. <laughs> <laughs> All right. 
Uh, Jody, this is a North Bend viewer who says they're seeing all sorts of gray moths flying out of the grass while they're growing. What might those be? Probably sod webworms. All right. Bagworm viewers are hot to trot on treating. Is it time? And if so, with what? Depends where they are. I know in Douglas County, we did have our bagworms emerge. So keep on the lookout. I would start with spinosad or Bacillus thuringiensis, BTK. All right. All right. Uh, what is the name of the bug that you said last week eats Japanese beetles? And Wheel bug. <laughs> that was from Council Bluffs viewer. All right, a uh, Grand Island viewer wants to do what, uh, know what she can do right now to keep Japanese beetles away from her birch. Away from your birch. Mm -hmm. Any drench or anything like that? Um, you, you may be able to do a systemic on, on, on birch. All right. Uh, All right, where do bumblebees overwinter? The fertilized queen will overwinter in any sheltered place. So it could be in the ground, in a shed, somewhere. All right, nice job. Looks like Dennis. Nice job. One. <laughs> one. <laughs> Just one. All right, no horticulturist for once, so I get the plants of the week. And what we have is kind of a red and reddish and white combination. The big tall one here is one of our penstemons. We have a lot of different penstemons in the backyard farmer garden. We have Beautiful penstemons in the state, many of which are flowering right now. Most of them are June flowering. And of course, they're, they're also called beard tongue because what you see is that bearded stamen. That's one of the, one of the ways that the uh, botanists identify which ones they are. This actually is a seedling and the, the flowering, it's called a thierce, is about three feet tall. So this is a seedling that probably came from, I don't know, so, probably Husker Red at one point. And then this is a, uh, a honeysuckle. It's one of the vining honeysuckles. This is actually a, a variety called Major Wheeler. It, it has these fabulous, interesting leaves. The leaves are, this is called conate, and they're joined in the center on the, on the older leaves. So you can see that the, the center blooming stem comes right through the center of the leaf. A trumpet-shaped flower blooms for a very long time. This doesn't get very big, about six feet tall. Is not one of our invasive species. Um, so, so far, so good on this one. Absolutely adored later in the season by hummingbirds. So, plants of the week. All right. So now we go to uh, Jody. This is a viewer with a peach. This is in Lincoln. He says this tree is only three years old. Every year he has substantial tip dieback, but he's got these critters in it. And he sent three pictures. I don't know if you can really tell what these are, but he's hoping you can. Yeah, so this is the, um, the oriental fruit moth. Mm. And so it is uh, yeah, a caterpillar of a little brown moth. And there are so many different kinds of borers and moths in pests of peach. I know this because I have a peach tree that looks bad all the time. But they also call this one the peach um, tip moth because they get in into that stem there, they tunnel it, and they go right into the fruit and start eating the flesh. Um, and so sometimes these twigs will, like these stems will die and it'll drop. So there are a number of products you can use. Um, I looked up the, I think it's the University of Missouri Extension um, fruit tree schedule, uh, like malathion, carbaryl, spinosids on there, esphen, valerate, permethrin, so there's a variety, but that did say to treat like every 10 to 14 days, so it's something you have to keep up with. All right, unfortunate. Yeah, <laughs> these trees are high maintenance. Yes, exactly. <laughs> All right, uh, Dennis, this is a Stella Nebraska viewer, has seen these holes in the, in the yard, seven to eight inches wide, six to 10 inches deep in random spots and he's wondering what they are and wonders how to get rid of whatever is doing this. Well, we gotta find out what it is. It, 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 it's a different hole. I can see it's been rained on since it's been dug. Mm -hmm. It's gotta be a fox or possibly a coyote. I'm going more towards a fox, but it doesn't look indicative of something like a groundhog or anything like that. 
So I'm thinking more of a, of, of a fox just trying to, maybe a young fox trying to find a new place or something like that. Mm, or something to eat under there. Yeah, or there's something to eat under there, yeah. All right, so this one is, um, this next one is about an eight inch diameter hole and they're in Perkins County and they're in town, so they're not in the country. Yeah, but in Perkins County there's, you're, you're almost always in the country. <laughs> I've been there. Um, <coughs> anything can walk in. That's almost looking a somewhat badger-like to me. Mm -hmm. It's oblong, and the paw prints are, are, are indicative of a lot of weight to be pushed in that soft soil. Mm -hmm. So that could be a badger looking for ground squirrels or something. All right, and then our, your third one here is northern Hamil Hamilton County along the river. They keep getting these piles of sand in their flower beds. Uh, he's That's used pocket gopher, okay. plains pocket gopher in the sand, looking for tubers of any kind. And it looks like, I don't know, there might be some plants there that have tubers like um, Jerusalem or artichokes. Mm -hmm. They would, yeah. They love those, and those are very common in that sandy soil. All right, he, he has uh, been using an, a, an electronic pest controller. They don't do anything. Yeah, that's... except take your money. <laughs> and that's kind of what he's saying as well. 100% in effect. All the university tests on them. All right. Okay, Kyle. Um, we ha Oh, fourth one. Sorry, we have one more, Dennis. I forgot. Oh. This is actually a, um, a viewer who is in Nance County. Okay. And she's Nance seeing County. all these around all these, it, like the mulch around yeah. her plants. She it says- It could be something like a, a skunk or an opossum digging okay. for grubs or worms or some other food source. It looks like a lot of mulch. That, and, and that would be harborage for, you know, uh, you know, a lot of grubs, you know, not just, not long grubs, but the big beetle grubs and that'd be, like, you know, popcorn shrimp to those skunks. They just trump their attention. <laughs> well, and she did um, say they have muskrats in the backyard. Would that yeah, probably Muskrats not? are herbaceous eaters. Okay. They're eating, you know, plants. Okay. They're eating cattail roots and things like that, so. Okay. All right, now your turn, All right. Kyle. <laughs> this is also a peach question. Uh, we had a couple of these peaches, uh, sap coming out from ground level or sap coming like this. And this is actually from a Hershey viewer, wondering uh, whether they need to replace this. The, the, the first picture, or the first one was our peach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, um, so the, that kind of gummy looking stuff coming out, uh, that's just gamosis, very, very common on peach trees. Um, t generally, it can, can be caused by a few different things and so, uh, Fire blight is, is one that people, whenever they see gamosis like this, they, they do often think about fire blight um, because it can kind of have those um, form cankers that where the bacteria can kind of ooze out. So that's a possibility. However, if you're not seeing other symptoms of fire blight, so the, um, oh, the that stereotypical shepherd's crook um, and blackening of the leaves and petioles, then it could just be a sign of general stress on the, on the tree. And, do whatever you can to make the tree healthier. Um, All right, and then you have a couple of people that send pictures of ornamental pears, which was that last picture. Yeah, so if we go back to the picture with the uh, the black spots on the leaf, there we go. Um, this is a Fabrier leaf spot. Um, this is one that uh, it's more much more common at the end of the season, but it can show up this time of year. Um, typically, not a whole lot. Um, not a whole lot to do. It's really just a cosmetic issue. It's not going to hurt the overall life of, life of the tree. All right. And then your final one is from Scotts Bluff, and uh, a very rusty-looking beast here. Yeah. And so this is this is one of our uh, one of our uh, one of our gymnosporangium rusts. We think. Um, since so this was a, uh, we decided it was a hawthorn, correct? We think so. And so we um, suspect this to be cedar hawthorn rust. And so similar to cedar apple rust, um, it will form some, some galls that kind of turn into orange jelly on cedar trees. And then this time of year, they're blowing onto the alternate host, which in this case it would be the hawthorns. Nothing you can do about it this time. Um, once you've already seen those spots on the leaves, infection has taken place. And so next year, you really wanna be thinking about some sort of fungicide application at flowering on the hawthorn and that should um, control the, the rust. 
All right, good old cedar something something rust. Cedar something rust. <laughs> All right. Well, vines have a lot to offer in many landscapes. They come in a wide variety of blooming colors and shapes. Some are even great for those pollinators and those birds. But beware, they can really become a handful if some of them are left to their own devices. We're getting a lot of questions from people about using vines in their landscape. And I want to give you a few hints on how you actually make that decision because you can get stuck with a real mess on your hands if you don't deliberately take the time to figure out what you want that vine to do. A lot of people want the beauty and the fabulous flowers of something like clematis. Others want to be able to attract pollinators or hummingbirds, which is possible with the honeysuckles. So what you need to look at is what is the habit of the vine? How does it actually vine and how big will it get? So deliberately think about, do you want something at six feet? Do you want a herbaceous vine, which does mean that all of that foliage is going to die to the ground in the winter months? That really suggests, not only suggests, but you will have to do some management on that. You'll have to take those vines down, you'll have to pull them off your supporting structure and let them start over again. So that's a management issue. If instead you want something to crawl all the way up and over a pergola or an arbor of some sort, you may be looking at a vine that has a more aggressive character to it and also climbs differently. You'll have to determine what is the size of the structure that will be needed to support that vine. And again, just because it's really more woody in character and does not die all the way back to the ground every season, that does not mean you're not going to have to do a fair amount of pruning. That is particularly true on a couple of the vines that people really love. One of them being, of course, grapes. Grapes need to be pruned back significantly if you want them to actually fruit. And wisteria is another one. Let's talk for a minute about actually how vines vine, because again, that has a great deal to do with how you're going to use them and the structure you're going to give them. We talk about vines that twine, and the twining can be the actual stem itself, as in bittersweet, or it can be the petiole of the leaf, which is uh, typically the way that clematis grow. For twining vines, you're going to have to give them something that is small enough and close enough spaced so that they can actually wrap themselves around that. Some of the larger, aggressive, climbing, twining vines will actually strangle, if you will, a post. So again, it's that motion of the vine itself that gets them up and over. Then we have vines that actually hang on by adventitious roots. They look like mustaches or they look like uh, Jody's millipedes. And those actually attach themselves to a structure. So they are not going to twine around a chain link fence as an example, but they will attach themselves and they're very difficult to scrape off. So you've got the adventitious roots. Climbing hydrangea is one of the vines that does that. And then we have the ones that, that actually cling with um, they look like little frog feet, little tiny pads that attach. Boston Ivy is an example of that. Again, they're going to go up and climb on any structure that allows them to attach so they can go a lot higher. They can also be very, very difficult to get off if you decide they're going in the wrong direction. So again, you start with what do you want that vine to do? Is it herbaceous? Is it woody or semi-woody, what is the structure you want that vine to hang on to? If it's something like a climbing rose, as an example, they don't climb by themselves at all. You want the roses, you're going to have to train them. Then you purchase in the garden center a vine typically in a container, and you'll look at that vine and you'll think, good grief, that is going to be very difficult for me to untwine, untangle, and get going. So. Look at how that vine has been managed in the garden center, put them in the ground, enjoy what they're going to provide for you. There really are lots of great vines to choose from as long as you understand how they grow and you keep an eye on them over the years. Next time on Backyard Farmer, we're going to go over some techniques to help you keep those vines from taking over. All right, so now Jody, okay. final round here. This is a carny viewer. Um, she says these spots show up every single year on her iris 
and the iris are slowly declining. She wants to know what they are and how do you treat them? Okay, well, if it's coming up every year and they look like this, this looks like iris borer. Mm -hmm. So what you can do is uh, a lot of sanitation after, after the blooms. So you'll wanna cut down and remove those leaves because that's where they will lay their eggs. And so you can remove the eggs so they don't hatch next year. And also you may dig up the rhizomes after the blooms and you may see like a, a really big caterpillar. Um, you want to remove that infected part so that next year, you know, it will be like a clean plant. So Exactly, because if it is not a clean plant, then mm -hmm. the next time the question goes to Kyle for rotten. <laughs> <Indeed. laughs> yeah, it's the most rotten common iris. <laughs> iris insect problem, so. All right, uh, your, your second picture here is a climbing rose with issues. This is rural Lancaster County. Uh, you, you actually talked about this last week. She fertilized it, but uh, she's never seen a caterpillar. Fertilizer is not the right approach. Okay, yeah, so this damage has been done by the rose slug sawfly. And actually, I zoomed in. I could actually see one of them on the leaves. Mm -hmm. But this week, I didn't see any, so they might have fallen down and already gone into cocoon. They turn into, like, stingless wasps. So right now, I mean, the roses look fine. I would just prune those parts off. They don't destroy or kill the, the roses. But next year, start scouting early as soon as they start to leaf out you want to check the undersides of the leaves for tiny little uh, soft fly larvae and pick those off spray them off they're really fragile so all right your third one <clears throat> is a uh, choke cherry in goner uh, and you got it because this is one of those things that gets mixed up i think is this insect or does this belong in yeah. kyle's realm yeah and I looked into it, I, and mm -hmm. um, like there's no frass, and right. I, I just didn't really know. So I did a little digging, and then, yeah, I, I contacted Kyle. So, Kyle, what is happening to our leaves here? Oh, it's <laughs> a, a shot hole, and right. it's really just a, it's a description of the symptoms. It's not a, not a, there's not a shot hole disease. There's a few, there's a couple of bacteria, a couple of different fungi that can cause those similar symptoms. <clears throat> The uh, wet spring that we've had is the main reason that we've had them. The, uh, the set, the, so we get these lesions that form, the centers die and just drop out, and then we have those nice circular holes. All right, so no big deal. No big deal. All right, uh, Dennis, this is, uh, this is a fun story sent by this viewer, uh, a raccoon scoundrel, and, um, <clears throat> excuse me, it's really, for your comment on what raccoons will eat, because this was preen, natural preen, which is made from corn, ah. left in the barn or in the garage and then came back out and thought, what in the world has happened? So what will raccoons eat? They're omnivorous, <clears throat> they'll eat about anything. So they'll, they'll eat corn, they'll eat corn right off the, you know, the plant, mm -hmm. both sweet corn and uh, field corn. And I was wondering, why would he, why would they want to, you know, get the weeds out of their garden? The, the raccoon. <laughs> um, but if it's on a corn base, then mm -hmm. yeah, they don't care if it's a, well, I'm sure once they taste it, they may give up on it. I don't know. You know, I've never tasted I never tasted preem either. I'm, I don't, I think on the label it says keep out of the reach of children. children. It doesn't say keep out of the reach of raccoons. Yeah. Um, yeah, so they, were so, after the, they were after it, just like they're after bird seed. Right. It's the same difference. So protect whatever it is you think they're going to eat or get yeah. rid of the raccoons. I would think Preem would give a raccoon quite the stomach ache, but I don't have any data to back that up. Sounds like a good thing for a UCARE student. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mine. <laughs> All right, and then we have a critter ID. Um, this is, she's wondering, is this a mouse or a vole, and do they carry uh, diseases? Uh, well, voles carry very little, but all rodents can carry something, fleas or ticks. But from this view, it's hard to tell. By the long feet and the teeth and the slight pockets, where, where county is it from? It's like from a, outside Lincoln. Outside Lincoln. Oh, mm -hmm. That's not what I first thought it was. I would say, yeah, I there's no other pictures. This mm -hmm. is hard. It's, it's, you know, all I see is the nose and the mouth and the feet. Um, I can't even tell my own kids if I only see their nose. Now. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think I'm it looks I'm like a go. little gnome. Yeah, <laughs> but the feet look so long. I'm thinking almost, you know, something young. Mm -hmm. Whiskers are awful long, too. Mm -hmm. At first I was thinking, you know, deer mouse. Of course, I don't have anything. Yeah. 
So it might be a deer mouse, and then you don't you want to stay away from the droppings because of Hanta. Yeah. Um, but the, that's the best I could do. You know, if they want to send in a picture, a, a side view, or a top view, I probably could tell you what it is. Then. <laughs> right. Or even a little bit of the fur. I'll, do a DNA analysis and tell you exactly what it no, is. No, no, no. <laughs> all right, um, Kyle, we're going to pile power through these because we only have about a minute and a half. All right. These are all shrooms. Perfect. Uh, the first one is, what's this one? So, um, just first, before, anytime we have mushroom picture, it's really hard to tell what it is just from a top view like that. It's no different than getting a picture of a mouse only having its belly. <laughs> um, <laughs> However, I kind of think that this is a, an uh, agrocivi. Um, as far as the what gene or what species it is, I'm not entirely sure. Might be agrocivi preus, um, based on it being in the mulch bed. But yeah, it's uh, just a common one. Don't eat it though. <laughs> All right, our second one is lots of mushrooms in the front yard. Uh, what are they, and are they because of the tree roots? Yes. So I think these uh, these are little brown mushrooms, um, LBMs, and it can be very difficult to differentiate all the different L little brown mushrooms there are, especially from this far out. I do think that these are coprinus mushrooms, um, and they, they really op often form in the, um, come up in clumps like that. And yeah, they're just de decomposing old tree roots or something wood in the soil. All right, and how about this third one? That looks like an older oyster mushroom. Um, and so this one is, again, if you do have your experience foraging and you are confident what, with your identification, this is one that is edible. Um, however, you do wanna make sure that you really know what you're eating before you ever eat any mushrooms that you find. All right, thank you, Kyle.